Hello, I am Sarita and in this lecture uh, I will be discussing about the late evolutionary stages of stars. We will start first with giant stars. So, giant stars are comprised of red giant branch stars, the asymptotic giant branch stars as well as the super giant stars. Just as a recap, red giant branch stars are uh, luminous giant stars of uh, low to intermediate mass stars that is uh, 0.3 to 6 solar masses with inflated envelopes and the surface temperature is low of the order of 3000 to 5000 Kelvin and these are in the interior these are fusing hydrogen to helium in a shell and they have inert helium cores. This stage uh, lasts around a billion years. The asymptotic giant branch stars are uh, later evolutionary stages than red giant branch stars. They are very luminous and have thousands of times uh, the luminosity of the sun. Uh, in the interior, they have a double shell burning phase where one shell is fusing uh, helium to carbon and there is another shell fusing uh, hydrogen to helium. And these have inert carbon oxygen cores. The third group of giant stars is the super giant stars which are the late stages of massive stars. They are in the pre-supernova stage and, are, and they are very lum luminous. In all these stages, uh, there is an inflated envelope and the surface gravity is very low. And consequently, there is uh, an enormous amount of mass loss which occurs in these stages. Since these stars are uh, relatively large in size, uh, it has been possible to do direct imaging of these kind of giant stars which is shown uh, in the panel below. So, one can see that uh, uh, there are two small dots shown towards the center which uh, indicate the sizes of the main sequence stars and the size of the uh, giant stars and super giant stars are shown as red circles on the right and on top of this are shown the actual images taken at different wavelength bands uh, optical as well as millimeter. These represent direct images of the giant stars. Usually for stars, we are unable to resolve out stars and we see them as point like objects because of the limitations of our observing techniques. However, giant stars being much larger in size, it is possible to image them directly. So, we start off with uh, examples. So, this is uh, an example of a red giant star uh, called Mira, also known as Omicron City. This has uh, this is located at a distance of uh, 300 light years and uh, its spectral type is M73. So, M is the cool, type, uh, cool spectral type or the latest spectral type and 7 is the spectral subtype and 3 represents the luminosity class. The effective temperature of uh, this red giant star is uh, around 3000 Kelvin. It is around 1.1 solar mass. Its radius is around 350 solar radius and uh, its age is estimated to be 6 billion years. So, one can see on the left uh, uh, Mira and its companion on top. This is again a part of a binary star system and uh, below the Bino panel shows uh, the star Mira in uh, visible as well as in ultraviolet. One can see that in ultraviolet there is a, a small tail like structure. The ultraviolet image taken off uh, Mira using uh, Galax shows that uh, there is uh, a substantial amount of mass loss and this uh, gas which is lost is also very bright because it is hot and it shines in ultraviolet and it extends to quite a distance uh, from the star. So, the top panel on the right for shows the ultraviolet image and the bottom panel shows the visible where the Mira can be seen as a very bright spot. There is also a uh, thermal pulsations observed uh, towards this star Mira and in fact it has given rise to an entire class of variables uh, known as uh, Mira variables. So, the panel here shows uh, the variability observed towards uh, Mira. Next we come towards the asymptotic giant branch stars. These asymptotic giant branch stars are stars. Uh, 
which have an ex very extended envelope as explained earlier. Uh, one of the interesting things about the stars is that the outer envelope is so cool that uh, not only molecules are formed but all it is believed that uh, submicron sized dust particles are formed uh, in, in the outer envelopes of uh, the AGB stars. And the effect of the radiation pressure is to push this dust particles into the interstellar medium and uh, it is largely believed that most of the dust that we observed in the interstellar medium that is the medium between uh, the stars is uh, processed and generated in the in outer envelopes of asymptotic giant branch stars. This slide shows an example of uh, the dust generation and production. So, this is uh, uh, the picture shows uh, the dust from uh, the AGB star W hydrae. Here this is an ALMA image and one can see of, uh, that it is a combination of red and yellow images. The red uh, shows the location of silicon oxide molecules and the yellow shows the region of uh, the aluminum oxide. These are two important ingredients are found in interstellar dust. While the silicon dioxide is found to extend to very large regions, the uh, aluminum oxide is very close to the star. This helps researchers understand the process of dust formation in the envelope of the uh, asymptotic giant brown stars. An example of a supergiant star is Betelgeuse, uh, one uh, bright star in the constellation of Orion. These stars are very large in size and what is shown in the left panel is an artistic impression of the supergiant stars as well as the mass loss uh, which is seen from the star uh, along the scale of the solar system. So, on the, in, on the left panel there is a line, a vertical line which shows uh, the scale of the solar system. And it, uh, for example, the size of this supergiant star Betelgeuse is found to extend to Jupiter and the uh, mass loss extends till much larger distance uh, approximately 30 AU. And on the right is shown a panel uh, of an actual infrared picture of the supergiant star Betelgeuse. This is a uh, combination of two pictures. The outer flame uh, like structures which are seen in the image, a gas and dust shells which are thrown out by the supergiant star uh, which is seen as a dot in the center and to image this flame like structure one had to mask out the central regions which are very bright and that is appears as this black disc which is seen at the center. The um, supergiant star Betelgeuse which appears as a dot is a uh, an alternate image that is superposed on this image uh, to show us the location of Betelgeuse. We next move on uh, to uh, understanding about planetary nebulae. So, what are planetary nebulae? These are expanding shells of gas around a white dwarf progenitor. This name is a misnomer because uh, these uh, although they are not associated with planets they are called planetary nebulae because first observed by telescopes it was thought that they resemble gaseous planets. Planetary uh, nebulae emit uh, in ultraviolet. Be this is because uh, these represent the outer envelopes of the star which are ionized as well as excited by the ultraviolet radiation received from the white dwarf stars. In optical images, they are found to have vivid colors. For example, the bluish green which is because of oxygen lines and uh, neon lines. Uh, and the reddish hue is because of H alpha as well as nitrogen. It is found that these planetary nebula have very complex uh, but symmetric structures. So, some uh, pictures of planetary nebula that have been observed by the Hubble Space Telescope are shown in this slide. One can see that uh, they have very symmetric structures and the color hue indicates uh, the different species of ions uh, that are found in uh, those regions around the uh, nebula. Most of these planetary nebula are also found uh, to have a dot at the center which is the white dwarf that has been imaged uh, at the center of the planetary nebula. These have very symmetrical structures and uh, there is lot of work in trying to understand what gives rise to this complex symmetries. 
this is uh, in many cases it is uh, found that varying viewing angles and multiple ejections uh, not just one ejection of the envelope but multiple ejections from the stellar surface uh, could give rise to these symmetries in addition the presence of uh, a, a binary companion or the presence of magnetic field could also give rise to these complexest symmetries on smaller scales, it has been found that uh, bright cometary knots are seen close to these pan uh, planetary nebulae. This represents gas moving at very high velocities uh, away from the star of the order of 30 to uh, 40 kilometers per second. The estimated age of the planetary nebula is around uh, 10,000 to 50,000 years and currently around uh, 1500 planetary nebulae are known in our galaxy. This picture shows a planetary nebula uh, called Helix Nebula in the optical and the near infrared. So, the left side of the image is the optical image which is mostly from the ionization and excitation of atoms uh, whereas the right side of the picture shows the same nebula but in near infrared. As one can see uh, the near infrared uh, picture shows uh, cometary knots and these uh, the emission and the emission in near infrared is mostly due to the presence of cool dust as well as um, complex molecules unlike the optical. This panel shows uh, spectra taken towards two planetary nebulae. The left side shows the spectrum of a planetary nebula in NGC 1501. NGC is a catalog of uh, nebulous objects and uh, one can see a uh, number of uh, emission lines and uh, these are high excitation and high ionization lines for example one can see O6, O3 and uh, ionized helium, ionized oxygen lines. Uh, on the right is another planetary nebula sextant A and again one can see that uh, there are a large number of emission lines uh, towards this nebula. Based on these excitation lines people try to derive the physical conditions in the nebula and understand the uh, evolutionary stages. Although planetary nebula have been observed in different parts of the galaxy, in order to get, get an estimate of ages of these planetary nebula, uh, one area of research is to, uh, is to associate the planetary nebula with a given cluster. So, this uh, work for example shows uh, a planetary nebula Abel 8 and uh, the researchers Turner et al have tried to uh, associate this uh, with a cluster called Bika 6. Uh, the planetary nebula is seen as a ring like structure in the left side image and on the right side image uh, we can see an HR diagram where uh, one can see the main sequence uh, stars of the cluster as well as uh, the stars which have evolved off the main sequence. The central star of Abel 8 as one can see lies in the white, white dwarf region of this HR diagram. We next move on to trying to understand about white dwarf stars. So, what are white dwarf stars? These are hot stellar degenerate remnants of low mass stellar evolution as well as intermediate mass stellar evolution. So, the main sequence stars which uh, of mass up till 8 solar mass generally undergo mass loss and end up as white dwarf stars and the first white dwarf star to be uh, discovered was uh, Sirius B uh, which is the companion of Sirius A. The panel here shows the images of Sirius A and B. The left side shows the optical image and the right side shows the uh, X-ray image. The, in the optical image, one, one can see that Sirius A, the bright star that we see, is very bright. In fact, nearly 1000 times brighter than Sirius B, whereas in the X-ray image, Sirius B is much brighter than A. In fact, a careful study had shown that Sirius B was an exotic star and a further scrutiny led to uh, our understanding of uh, this Sirius B as a white dwarf star with degenerate matter. The white dwarf stars have a higher 
effective temperature because although there is no nuclear energy generation happening in the white dwarf stars, but they have a lot of heat which is radiated out. Um, as time passes by these white dwarf stars cool and these are faint low luminosity objects and therefore they lie towards the lower side of the HR diagram. A spectral analysis of white dwarfs have shown that white dwarfs can also be classified uh, according to their spectra. Although the white dwarf is given a spectral classification of D, there are various subtypes that are observed and uh, these are uh, given alphabets A, B, C, Q and Z. For example, one can have a white dwarf which is DA or DB or DC. Now, what are DA type white dwarfs? These represent white dwarfs uh, which have only pressure broadened hydrogen lines. No other lines are observed and nearly two thirds of known white dwarfs are found to be of DA type. And DB type white dwarfs are those where only helium absorption lines are observed and hydrogen lines are nearly absent. Around 8% of known white dwarfs are uh, found to be of DB type. The DC are those where only continuum is seen and no absorption lines are seen and 14% of the known white dwarfs are found to be of this category. Then one has also found white dwarfs. Uh, which are a bit different and these are given the nomenclature of DQ and DZ. DQ if carbon lines are seen in the spectra and DZ if heavy metal lines are seen in the spectra of white dwarfs. This panel shows the spectra of uh, white dwarfs. On the left panel one can see the uh, four DA white dwarfs in the globular cluster NGC uh, 6397 this spectra are in the optical regime. So, the Balmer lines are clearly seen and uh, on the right hand side the optical uh, spectra of known uh, white dwarfs in the having spectral types DB, DC are also shown. What is the origin of these different spectral uh, classes of uh, white dwarfs? In the case of a DA type as hydrogen lines uh, are prominently seen, it is believed that uh, the matter gets vertically stratified because uh, in a star it is made up of hydrogen, helium and other trace elements. Uh, after it has reached the white dwarf stage, it is believed that a vertical stratification of matter takes place and the heavier elements move down whereas a hydrogen moves near the surface. Consequently, when a spectrum is taken, uh, the outer uh, hydrogen is responsible for the absorption lines seen in such white dwarfs and it is believed that this happens on relatively fast time scales of the order of 100 years. The origin of non-DA uh, type uh, white dwarfs is uh, probably mass loss and uh, stripping of uh, either mass loss that is stripping of hydrogen from the surface alternately it could also be because of convective mixing. That is if carbon lines are seen or metal lines are seen these have been brought to the surface because of the convective mixing of the outer layers. There is also a special category of white dwarfs which are pulsating and these are known as ZZ Sethi uh, variables after uh, ZZ Sethi white dwarf and this is because of pulsations, radial pulsations in these white dwarfs. These kind of variable white dwarfs are uh, given the classification uh, V. So, for example, you one can have DAV as a, a variable DA type white dwarf. And it is believed that partial ionization uh, zones are responsible for the changing opacity and hence the radial oscillations. Now, the cores of the white dwarfs are degenerate and the degeneracy relation is uh, given as uh, pressure is equal to K1 uh, constant times uh, the mass density by mu e raised to the power 5 by 3 where mu e is related to the average number of electrons uh, per nucleon. One consequence of uh, this non-relativistic degeneracy pressure is that there is a maximum mass to which uh, the white dwarf can be supported and uh, this has been found to be 1.4 solar masses. And if the mass of the white dwarf uh, exceeds 1.4 solar masses, then the electrons uh, become relativistic. They are degenerate but become non-relativistic. However, this kind of matter is highly unstable and uh, it undergoes collapse. And another consequence of uh, this degeneracy pressure is uh, a mass volume relation. It has been found that the mass uh, multiplied with the volume of white dwarfs is constant that is mass is inversely proportional to volume. 
higher the mass of the white dwarf, smaller is the volume. This can also be understood from uh, our understanding of the degeneracy pressure. More the mass the white dwarf has, uh, the denser it should be in order to generate higher degeneracy pressure. We next look at uh, this category of stars known as neutron stars. These are uh, remnants of high mass stars, the cores which are supported by neutron degeneracy pressure. The existence of such kind of stars was first proposed in 1934 um, and as neutrons are also spin half particles, it is believed that they are responsible for uh, the hydrostatic equilibrium which is holding up the neutron stars. In these cases, the matter is very dense and uh, the densities can reach as high as 10 power 17 kilogram per meter cube. For white dwarf stars, this uh, one can imagine that uh, this Ma if the mass is of the mass of the sun, then the size of the white dwarf uh, will be roughly the size of the earth. That gives us an idea of the density of the white dwarf star. In case of neutron star, if one assumes that the mass of the star is greater than 1.4 solar masses, uh, the size that one is uh, expected to have so that uh, neutron degeneracy pressure supports it is expected to be around 10 to 15 kilometers, which is which means that the matter is extremely dense. Uh, that is, it can exceed the atomic density. So, if we consider a neutron star whose mass is uh, 1.5 solar masses, then the surface gravity is of the order of uh, 10 power 12 meter per second square and the escape velocity is uh, a high fraction of the velocity of light. Now, what is the structure of these kind of neutron stars? One needs to understand the equilibrium configuration of the nucleons that are present as well as electrons that are present because these are neutral as well as some iron nuclei that are present. So, there are a lot of models to help us under understand the uh, structure of these neutron stars because the nature of matter at such high densities uh, is not known to us. So, the proposed structure of the neutron star is shown here and uh, one can imagine a neutron star to have various layers, outer crust, inner crust and which is shown in the left hand side panel and the anticipated densities are also listed. You have an interior which is a superfluid of neutrons, protons and then a core where the matter density is so high that uh, we are not certain of the various particles that are present there and the particle interactions that are possible. Uh, the table on the right hand side lists the uh, constituents of uh, the various uh, layers. For example, the outer crust is made up of mostly iron nuclei, non-relativistic free electrons and as you go inward these electrons become relativistic and in the inner crust one can see that there is neutron, neutron rich nuclei and this is supported by neutron degeneracy pressure and as one goes towards the uh, core or the center of the neutron star the densities become so high uh, that the various particles are produced and one needs to have a better understanding of the physics in these regions. Similar to the white dwarf stars, the neutron stars also have a mass volume relation because they are supported by the degeneracy pressure of the neutrons. Again, the more massive a neutron star, the smaller the volume it will occupy. And modeling has suggested that the upper mass limit for a neutron star is around 2.2 solar mass for a non-rotating neutron star and for a rotating neutron star it can be higher of the order of th uh, 3 solar masses. And if the mass of the core is larger than 3 solar masses, then even the neutron degeneracy pressure cannot support uh, the collapse resulting in the formation of a black hole. There are two properties of neutron stars which were anticipated and later found. First is it was expected that uh, these kind of neutron stars would uh, have a rapid rotation. This is because of the conservation of the angular momentum. The uh, before the formation of the neutron star, uh, the massive star passes through a supergiant phase. If the supergiant is found to be rotating slowly, uh, then it is expected that when it uh, contracts uh, and forms a neutron star which is very compact, then it would be uh, rotating very rapidly. The other property that was anticipated was that it would have a very high magnetic field because of the conservation of magnetic flux.
so now we come to uh, this class of objects known as pulsars and uh, as we will see these pulsars represent neutron stars which are rotating as well as have high magnetic field so uh, how were these objects first found so jocelyn bell and anthony huish in 1967 were actually were setting up a number of uh, radio dipole antenna in the english countryside and uh, they found that uh, there were uh, certain blips which were very regularly spaced and uh, after eliminating all sources they realized that this is actually from a cosmic source they were puzzled because these were uh, separated by uh, very precise duration uh, of 1.337 seconds this pulsar uh, we now know is the pulsar psr 1919 plus 21 at that time various models were proposed to understand the nature of uh, these precise pulses this included uh, binary stars pulsating stars and rapidly rotating neutron stars based on the period of pulsation the binary star and the pulsating star ideas were discarded and uh, it is now known that these pulses arise due to the rapid rotation of uh, neutron stars currently more than 2000 pulsars are known and observations of these pulses of light have been carried out across a range of wavebands and the uh, and the pulse duration varies uh, from milliseconds uh, to tens of seconds this is a simplified model of our understanding of uh, how the pulses of light are generated so in uh, this figure for example one can see the neutron star at the center the spin axis is uh, shown and the magnetic axis which is uh, distinct from the spin axis is also shown diagonally now when uh, the neutron star is rota rotating very rapidly the magnetic axis also rotates uh, uh, the magnetic field is a dipole field and one can uh, imagine uh, the magnetic lines are shown in blue in the panel now along the poles uh, magnetic poles the magnetic field is very high and it is expected that uh, the relativistic electrons which are present in the outer regions of the neutron stars can get accelerated relativistically around uh, these magnetic field lines and in the process uh, generate a synchrotron radiation and therefore what we see as pulses uh, is the outcome of the synchrotron radiation near the magnetic poles as the magnetic axis is rotating about the um, is rotating about the rotation axis the pulse of light also seems to rotate very much like what one observes in a lighthouse i would like to reiterate that this is of course a very simplified model and uh, um, research has shown that pulses are far from simple they have a various uh, structures and uh, the pulse duration varies so a number of effects need to be considered uh, in order to understand the radiation emission mechanisms and the structure close to a neutron star now some of the basic properties of the pulsars are uh, listed here most pulsars have uh, periods between 0.25 seconds that is a uh, few milliseconds and seconds and they are extreme they have extremely well defined periods that is uh, the they can be the pulses the pulses are precise uh, up to 15 to 17 decimal places this is because the pulse duration is very short and uh, the time period between the pulses is also short uh, allowing us to make uh, innumerable measurements or a very large number of measurements giving rise to this precise time period in addition it is also found that uh, these uh, periods are slowing down with time of the order or that is uh, p dot that is the rate of change of period is of the order of 10 power minus 15 below what is shown are the um, pulses observed from three pulsars at uh, radio frequencies and each panel shows the pulse shape at different frequencies one can see that at different frequencies the pulse shape is slightly different and other uh, effects need to be uh, considered in order to understand this change in the shape of the pulses we now go on to understanding about uh, supernovae 
So what are supernovae? These are transient explosive events. There are historic uh, records of supernovae when certain bright uh, stars were found to have brightened by many orders of magnitudes. For example, the supernova uh, in uh, 1006 that is called AD 1006 supernova, then the Crab supernova which happened in 1054 AD and the most recent closest supernova was uh, the supernova 1987A. A represents the first supernova of the year. This happened in the large Magellanic cloud which is uh, uh, an irregular galaxy, our neighbor, located around 50 kiloparsecs from us. The supernova have also been classified based on both their spectra and light curves. So they were first classified as type 1 and type 2. This type 1 and type 2 classification is based on the spect uh, spectra taken during the supernova explosion. So the uh, type 1 supernova do not contain hydrogen absorption lines, whereas the type 2 supernova contain strong hydrogen absorption lines. Further, it was found that type 1 could be uh, subcategorized into A, B and C. So type 1 A represents that class of supernova which have strong silicon absorption lines in the spectra. Type 1 B represent those which have strong helium lines and type 1 C are those which do not have strong helium lines in their spectra. And this classification is uh, evident in this slide on the right. And the spectra of uh, the various classes is uh, shown in the left panel. For example, the top spectra is uh, supernova type 1A and uh, which uh, type 1A which does not show hydrogen lines but it shows the sili uh, silicon lines, absorption lines. Then the next one is the supernova type 2 and one can see that there are uh, strong absorption lines, the H alpha, H beta, H gamma, there are also other lines and uh, type 1b uh, type 1b and type 1c are shown below uh, and one can see that uh, there are uh, helium lines in 1b which are absent in 1c this slide shows the light curve of the supernova as these are transient explosive events we measure the brightness as a function of time uh, the left hand panel uh, shows the type 1 supernova light curve and one can see that it has a very characteristic light curve. Uh, the uh, radiation from the supernova increases, it reaches a peak and then falls down and then falls more slowly. On the right hand panel, we see the type 2 supernovae, uh, but the light curves again show a distinction. One can see that there are type 2p uh, supernovae as well as type 2L supernovae. So the P represents uh, the pl plateau in the supernovae light curve. So one can see that there is a plateau. Variations in the light curve are related to the radioactivity and the genesis of uh, nuclear elements during the uh, supernova phase. During the supernova, an enormous amount of energy is released, uh, making the star brighter uh, than even the galaxy. For uh, it is anticipated and it has been it has been found that nearly 10 power 46 joules of energy is released, uh, but not all of it goes in radiation. Only around 0.01% of this energy is released as radiation. 1% of this energy uh, is believed to be responsible for the kinetic energy of the in, uh, ejected material and the rest of the energy more than 99% is in the form of uh, neutrinos. In fact, the neutrinos uh, from uh, cosmic object other than the sun was for the supernova 1987A from the Kamiokande detector in Japan. We now know that supernova type 2 as well as type 1B and 1C are related to the uh, evolution of a single massive star leading to the formation of a neutron star. That is, this these uh, classes of supernova represent the core collapse supernova as explained earlier. What explains the type 2 versus type 1b and type 1c for the core collapse supernova? Uh, the type 2 have uh, the hydrogen absorption line. So it is believed that these arise because of uh, explosion of the supergiant star as a supernova. However, uh, type 1b and 1c do not have hydrogen in their spectra and it is believed that this is uh, because of the loss of hydrogen uh, from the envelope, uh, probably because of mass loss. The type 1 supernova on the other hand is not associated with the evolution of a massive star. This result has been arrived at because these type of supernovae have been observed in a large number of galaxies where massive stars 
are either not present or uh, if they are present are expected to be in very small numbers. Uh, therefore, it is believed that type 1 A supernova is not due to the core collapse of a massive star. Uh, we now uh, associate type 1 A uh, supernova with a white dwarf system. Uh, that is a white dwarf in a binary system and when this white dwarf uh, uh, takes in material, accretes material from the companion, then it can become massive and it can explode uh, as a supernova in the later evolutionary stages. So, this slide shows uh, the crab supernova remnant. Supernova remnant represents the nebulous surroundings of the uh, progenitor that is the neutron star or the black hole that is it represents the uh, energy transport of the supernova to the surrounding interstellar medium which becomes so hot that it emits in x-rays ultraviolet and a whole uh, range of wavelengths. Here what is shown in this panel is the crab supernova remnant and at the center one can see uh, the crab pulsar. The vertical panels on the right sh uh, shows an enlargement of the two stars is seen at the center, one of which is the crab pulsar. Therefore, one can observe that uh, one of the stars uh, uh, brightness remains constant whereas the brightness of the uh, pulsar is increasing with time and then decreasing which is, indicates the pulsating nature of the uh, crab pulsar. The crab supernova remnant in this panel is shown across a range of wavelength bands uh, from radio to infrared to visible light to ultraviolet, X-rays is shown in the middle panel below and then gamma rays. One can see that this crab supernova remnant looks very different in different wavelength bands. This is because at in different wavelength bands, uh, the emission that is being received uh, is the result of certain characteristic physical processes. Therefore, by studying uh, a particular object in a given wavelength band, one can understand the physical processes associated with that wavelength regime. In X-rays, for instance, one can clearly see um, uh, the jet-like emission from the crab pulsar as well as a disk-like structure around it. This shows a number of supernova remnants. Crab is shown in, in general, uh, 3C48 is shown in the panel below and also the Tycho supernova remnant is uh, seen as a spherical remnant on the right side of the image. Now we go to the um, other class of compact objects known as the black holes. So, black holes represent the ultimate gravitational collapse of a massive star. Now, if the it is expected that if the initial mass of the star is greater than 25 solar masses, uh, then it will result in a black hole because it exhausts all the sources of nuclear fusion and the mass of the core is sufficient uh, for it to overcome uh, the neutron degeneracy pressure. Black holes are usually described by a spherical uh, surface known as the Schwarzschild radius. It is also known as the event horizon because uh, light cannot escape this uh, radius and no information can be received about the black hole or uh, from within this. In other words, light is frozen in time at this radius. This Schwarzschild radius is given uh, by this relation uh, Rs is equal to 2 gm by c square. It is black holes are generally described as a singularity within uh, the Schwarzschild radius. One can also estimate the mass of a black hole based on the gravitational influence of the black hole on other objects that are the stars in the vicinity. And black holes based on their mass are ca categorized into three types. One is the stellar mass black holes, the intermediate mass black holes and the supermassive black holes. So, the stellar mass black holes generally are found to have masses between 3 and 15 solar masses. It is believed that these are the result of the core collapse of massive stars. However, there are black holes which are found to have masses in the range hundreds to thousands of solar masses. These are called intermediate mass black holes. These are likely to develop in the course of uh, dense environments such as globular clusters either through the uh, super uh, either through supermassive stars, through the collapse of supermassive stars or the mergers of stellar mass black holes. Then there is the supermassive black holes uh, which are found at the centers of the galaxies and these are found to have masses of the range uh, a million to a billion solar masses. And in fact, most of the galaxies are now believed to harbor uh, black holes at uh, their center. 
It is believed that these black holes uh, probably formed due to collisions between the galaxies or they could be an extension of uh, the intermediate mass black hole. Even the Milky Way has a supermassive black hole at the center whose mass is of the order of uh, 3.7 uh, million solar masses. This is the first picture of a supermassive black hole that has been taken uh, very recently in op uh, April 2019. Uh, this shows the center of the galaxy M87 and this has been uh, carried out by the, a large collaborative effort uh, in the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. And with this I stop. Thank you.